हाय एवरीबॉडी वेलकम टू माय यूट्यूब चैनल डॉक्टर श्रीनिवास मेडिकल कॉन्सेप्ट्स एंड माय एफबी पेज डॉक्टर श्रीनिवास कॉन्सेप्ट्स दिस इज डॉक्टर श्रीनिवास न्यूरोलॉजिस्ट फ्रॉम राजमंडरी आंध्र प्रदेश आई एम ऑल्सो द मेडिकल ऑथर ऑफ द बुक फोकस्ड न्यूरोलॉजी माय ईमेल इज श्री के एल पी एम एट जी मेल डॉट कॉम टूडे वी आर गोइंग टॉक अबाउट अ वेरी वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक द सिंपथेटिक इनर्वेशन ऑफ द आई the sympathetic innervation of the eye cranial nerves part 7 oculomotor nerves part 3 the eye especially the pupil is controlled by two pathways one the sympathetic pathway which causes the dilatation of the pupil second is the parasympathetic pathway which causes constriction of the pupil so the pupillary size is controlled by two pathways sympathetic pathway which causes the dilatation of the pupil and the parasympathetic pathway which causes the constriction of the pupil here in lies a very interesting concept after death the pupil is dilated fixed and not reacting to light but when we say that the sympathetic and parasympathetic causes the pupil to dilate and constrict respectively after death we expect the pupil to be in the mid position but what we see practically is that after death the pupil is dilated <clears throat> not in mid position what is the mechanism why is it so the pupillary dilatation after death it is explained by two schools of thought the one school of thought says that as the person is dying during the process of uh, death and dying there is a sympathetic surge and therefore the pupil gets dilated the second school of thought is that though the pupil is controlled both by sympathetic and parasympathetic it is the parasympathetic which has got more control over the pupil than the sympathetic and hence after the death the parasympathetic control over the pupil which is more gets affected and therefore pupillary constriction does not take place there is pupillary dilatation so whatever may be the mechanism of action the pupil is dilated after death and it is not in the mid position right the sympathetic innervation of the eye the sympathetic innervation of the eye the sympathetic pathway causes dilatation of the pupil darkness stimulates the sympathetic innervation and causes dilatation of the pupil parasympathetic causes constriction of the pupil bright light or brightness stimulates the parasympathetic pathway and causes the constriction of the pupil the sympathetic pathway the sympathetic pathway to the eye begins in the hypothalamus so here you can see it begins in the hypothalamus and from there it descends this is known as the first order it goes to the c8 and t1 so this is the first order of the sympathetic pathway and the innervation to the eye the second order starts from the C A T one and goes till the superior cervical ganglion. So this is the second order from C A T one to the superior cervical ganglion, and the third part, third order starts from the superior cervical ganglion, goes to the carotid bifurcation, and goes on the internal carotid artery, joins the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve, and supplies the dilator pupillae through the long ciliary nerve. causing the pupillary dilatation so we have the three orders the first order coming from the hypothalamus to the c8 t1 and the second order coming from the c8 t1 to the superior cervical ganglion and the third order coming from the superior cervical ganglion going through the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve and supplying the dilator pupillae through the long ciliary nerve so the first order neuron descends from the hypothalamus through the brain stem and upper cervical spinal cord the second order neuron lies in the intermedial lateral gray column at c8 t2 of the upper thoracic spinal cord that is the cilio spinal center of birch and the third order neuron ascends from the superior cervical ganglion and continues to the pupillo dilator muscle the post ganglionic fibers of the third order neuron lie on the wall of the common carotid artery forming the pericarotid sympathetic plexus the sympathetic fibers innervating the facial structures especially the sweating follows the external carotid artery at the bifurcation whereas the sympathetic pathway fibers destined for the eye 
example dilatation of the pupil follows the internal carotid artery so here is a very important concept if there is a lesion proximal to the carotid bifurcation it affects the sympathetic pathway both on the external carotid artery therefore sweating of the face gets affected it affects the sympathetic pathway on the internal carotid artery causing ptosis and meiosis ptosis is because the muller's muscle gets affected and meiosis because the dilatation of the pupil is affected so this is known as horner syndrome so if there's a lesion proximal to the carotid bifurcation it causes horner syndrome ptosis meiosis and anhydosis and a lesion distal to the bifurcation causes oclosympathetic paresis that is horner syndrome minus anhydosis since the lesion is distal to the carotid bifurcation the sympathetic pathway on the external carotid artery gets uh, es escapes and therefore there is no sweating on the face so there is horner syndrome minus anhydosis a very important clinical point the pericarotid sympathetic plexus continues along the internal carotid artery in its course through the cavernous sinus sympathetic fibers then join the nasociliary branch of the first division of the trigeminal nerve enter the orbit through the superior orbital fissure they continue as the long ciliary nerves to the pupillodilator muscle sympathetically innervated smooth muscle is present in the upper and the lower limbs to serve as accessory retractors the upper lip muscle is known as muller's muscle which is distinct and the inferior tarsal muscle in the lower lip is less distinct these are the important concepts of the sympathetic innervation of the eye another important concept is that sympathetic innervation it comes from the hypothalamus runs in the brain stem and goes to the pupillodilator muscle if there is a lesion in the pons what happens if there is a lesion in the medulla oblongata what happens if there is a lesion in the pons there is bilateral pupillary constriction pupils are small but bilaterally small whereas if the medulla oblongata if the sympathetic pathway gets affected you get unilateral small pupil why in pons you get bilateral small pupils it is because of the peculiar blood supply of the pons and medulla oblongata medulla oblongata is supplied by the two vertebral arteries but pons is supplied by a single basilar artery and therefore when the basilar artery is supplying the pons ruptures blood diffuses to both sides and both the sympathetic pathways get affected so you get bilateral horner syndrome so bilaterally pupils are small whereas if the medulla oblongata if it gets affected only one vertebral artery gets affected and therefore the sympathetic pathway on that side gets affected so pupil on one particular side is only small because medulla oblongata is supplied by two vertebral arteries unlike pons which is supplied by a single basilar artery so a pontine lesion because of the basilar artery rupture causes bilateral small pupils whereas a medulla oblongata because of the involvement of the vertebral artery causes an ipsilateral small pupil a very important concept uh, the other important neurology concepts i put in a book focused neurology written by me dr s rinwas it is available online from all leading booksellers including amazon if interested it could be bought online so these are the important concepts of sympathetic innervation to the eye uh, and the pupillary dilatation if you have enjoyed the video please like it and share it but do subscribe my channel dr sinwas medical concepts and my web page dr sinwas concepts thank you bye